Hello everyone and welcome to the PDP Design for Performance Blurring the Boundaries event. My name is Jasmine Dingara, I'm a creative producer and a visiting practitioner uh, for the BA Performance Design and Practice. Um, so I have the pleasure to introduce you uh, this design uh, event and you will see amazing and incredible projects um, around the idea of design, but it could be garment, set, film, uh, you will see. Uh, what is important for you to know is that um, you will watch some project from uh, Lydia Hardcastle called Fan, um, a project from Clara Dietmar, Florence Broomfield, Grace Campbell, Sam Cadwich and Malika Joy called Two-Headed Calf, a piece from Clara Dietmar called Eternal Process Moving On, a project from Maya Ross Russell called Que de Mille Felt, another project from Sam Catbush called No Words Underwater, a project from Jida Akil Monteverdi's L'Orfeo, and again a project from Leila Bradbury called Ega is also about L'Orfeo, then another project from Saki. Ushishiba and Yasmin Estanislao in four main movements, and finally a project from Georgia, Good Special, Yellow Quilt, Watch Me Learn. I hope you enjoyed this session. Thank you.
old you which grasp us at the stones that name the underlying dead by fibers net the dreamless head by roots are wrapped about the bones the seasons bring the flowers again and bring the first things of the flock and in the dusk of thee the clock beats out the little lives of men oh not for thee the glow the bloom who changes not in any gale nor branding summer sun's avail and touched by thousand years of bloom and gazing on thee the sullen tree sick of thy stubborn hardihood i seem to fail from out my blood and grow in corporate into thee Contemplate all this work of time, the giant laboring in his youth, nor dream of human love or truth, as dying nature's earth and line. But trust that those we call the dead are breathers of an ampler day, the ever nobler ends, they say, of solid earth whereon we tread. And tracks of fluent heat began, and grew to seeming random forms, the seeming prey of cyclic storms till at the last arose the man, who throve and branched from climb to climb, the herald of a higher race, and of himself in higher place, if so he types this work of time, within himself from more to more, or crowned with attributes of woe, like glories move his course and show, that life is not as idle or, but iron dug from central gloom, and heated hot with burning fears, and dipped in baths of the hissing tears, and battered with the shots of doom, to shape and use, arise and fly, the reeling form, the sensual thief, move upward, working out the beast, and let the ape and tiger die. O oh, sorrow, cruel fellowship, a priestess in the vaults of death, O oh, sweet and bitter in a breath, what whispers from thy lying lip? The stars, she whispers, blindly run, the web is woven across the sky, from outwaste places comes a cry, the murmurs from the dying sun, and all the fountain, nature stands, with all the music in his room, a hollow echo of the door. And shall I take a thing so blind, embrace her as my natural good, or crush her like a vice of blood upon the threshold of the mind?
My darling Jean, here is another picture of a garden at Bandarawala. I hope you are alright. Mummy told me you had some skating, which must have been grand fun. I have recovered from jaundice. Look after Mummy for me. Lots of love from Daddy. Our arrival at the village near my grandmother's rubber plantation was loud and chaotic. It was hot and sweaty and hundreds of people crowded around the car to welcome us as we arrived. Eventually we began walking to the estate. Despite the early morning, it was already a hot day for what seemed like it was going to be a long walk. We got to a stream and took off our shoes to wade across the cool running water. I wanted to stay there for the rest of the day, but this idea was not entertained by the matriarchy, grandmother, mother, and two aunts, who were by now, saris and all, halfway up what looked like a very steep hill. As my sister and I climbed and climbed, magical rubber trees began emerging in perfect columns, and at the top sat a beautiful thatched cottage. Inside was a wooden table and chairs, and a nice man mixing freshly brewed tea with milk made from powder and boiling water. Which, by the way, I learned many years later, was the key to this intoxicating elixir. Into the jug also went slices of fresh ginger and heaping spoonfuls of sugar. The nice man poured this mixture back and forth between two jugs till it was frothy before filling each teacup. My sister and I drank every sweet drop in complete silence.
The ocean speaks for itself. No words underwater. It lives through self-sufficiency. Not a son, and not a daughter. If my being came in word form, a question it would pose. A question hard to answer. A body that's not chose. For the time being, I'll stay here. I'll lay down still, submerged. There in the word is liquid. All thoughts in my brain surged. The darkness appears with its solution, draped me in black satin. Body before me floating, a complex form like Latin. A mouth where words are lost. The mouth of a solo dancer. The scales that need no numbers to give to me the answer. The tail that has no ending. The tail and its fin. The shell where all the waves live. The patience paper thin. In between the moon and the sun, a total eclipse of me. A creature lacking designation says so long and sets to see. Hi, my name is Layla. I'm a third year PDP student um, and I'm going to be talking about La Orfeo today. La Orfeo by Monteverdi is an early Baroque opera. It is one of the earliest examples of the genre that is still regularly performed today. Based on the Greek legend, it follows Orpheus's descent into the underworld to rescue his wife Eurydice. The opera is split into five acts and depicts various deities trying to assist him, from spirits to the god Apollo to Persephone. Set in the fantastical underworld and the fields of Frasch, it is filled with nymphs and ghosts, as well as depicting the painful reality of grief. In this video, I'm going to talk through my speculative set design for Cape Town Opera House. This is part of an opera project that ran from the beginning of spring term and culminated in a model presentation in March. It was led by Pete Brooks and guest designer Anna Fleischler. When first Approaching the libretto, I was interested in visualising the psychology and liminality of Orpheus's journey into the underworld, to show the process of his grief for his wife. My research took me into the work of the Pre-Raphaelite painters, as well as the work of M.C. Escher. Escher's mazes and illusions depicted the aftermath of death to me, when the familiar becomes distorted with a new reality. Orpheus's journey into the underworld was not just to rescue Eurydice, but to process and understand her death and play out his deepest and darkest regrets. We start in the prologue. The character of music introduces Orpheus's predicament. We are welcomed by an entryway of Doric columns decorated for a wedding. We're in the fields. Pastoral elements are mentioned widely and nature for me became a symbol of acceptance or joy or a closeness to the divine. There is a large sun that has a metallic finish that lights up the space and dominates our view. Music is simply our narrator, but she is outside of the action. The set is on a revolve. The set turns to give us a new perspective, so we're never really at ease with our surroundings. We are now inside at the wedding with guests and a table of presents and food. The best man is giving a toast. It was really important to me that our first two acts are really relatable, that we as an audience find Orpheus and Eurydice recognisable. We can sympathise with them to ultimately understand the rest of the opera. But the presence of the Doric columns also sets up the mythology of this piece that is widely known. Its origins and its presence as a timeless story passed from generation to generation. And I really love this contrast of the Doric columns as a structure in comparison to a very contemporary and recognisable set dressing and costume. The scene changes and we are aware that time has passed, decorations are being taken down, and it's the kind of clean up of the wedding. 
Uh, Silver is about to arrive and deliver news to Orpheus that Eurydice is dead from a snake bite. The sun is dulled and the intensity of the lights is not as bright as before. I wanted to lead the audience into the interval that gives a more psychological suggestion and sets them up for the rest. I used original hints by MC Escher to show how Orpheus's world has fallen apart. So we have this wonderful eye that lines up with the sun, which we've already seen. Um, and then we have this beautiful psyche of uh, the two lovers um, that gets untangled by chorus members, watching their kind of image just fall apart. During the interval, we have a large set change. It's pretty identical in structure, but it is now in the underworld. We have noticeable difference in colour palette and the types of textures that are seen on the stage. It's a light, darkish grey that's kind of murky, with bits of grass poking out. Orfeo is with hope, and above, on a fly sign, is abandon or hope. We're at the entryway. One of the great things about the Underworld set is the amount of levels that can be included. The stairs up and the stairs down often show the process and the journey through the Underworld, as well as the rotation of the revolve, shows this perilous and emotional journey. We have two plimps, or columns, that act as rostras for the infernal spirits. They watch on as a chorus and comment on the action, as well as act as messages to Priscina later on in the show. What's really nice is thinking about the idea of how the ghosts and infernal spirits would present themselves, and in this very stony, bleak atmosphere, statues seem like the perfect metaphor and visualisation of having an image of someone, but not actually having the person there. And I will pick up on this later when we see Eurydice and her return. The revolve slowly turns, revealing Caronte on his boat. Using the trapdoor that's on the revolve, I would bring the boat up in three sections that then connects together. There is a sea of haze, giving the illusion that there is some kind of water. As the revolve slowly turns and reveals the boat in all its majesty, we also have haze and light giving the indication of movement. We finish up on a diagonal, with the chorus watching on from the sidelines of the Apron, as well as Prosima watching on a diagonal to Orpheus, showing their unique situation and sympathy for each other. It shows and gives us an indication of what's to come. The stage revolves again and the boat disappears as well as Orpheo. We are now in the quarters of Pluton and Prospina. Prospina is begging Pluton to please have mercy on Orpheo and to give him back his love. We have the wonderful didactic columns and stairs which used to lead into the underworld but now work as a throne for Pluton to ponder on his predicament. Eurydice returns. She's framed beautifully on a diagonal with Orpheo in the entryway giving her an opportunity to fall back into the darkness and haze, feeling like we've truly lost Eurydice. We have Pluton and Priscina watching behind a column, anxiously, seeing whether Orpheo is up for the challenge of trusting his own wife. As Eurydice disappears from the entranceway into the darkness, Orpheo runs on the diagonal across the revolve to the entranceway and looks down. The revolve turns so that we can see his expression of complete loss and devastation of his wife. The chorus of infernal spirits gather in the entranceway as the stage revolves again and Orpheo is left to ponder and grieve on the steps and the floor. We see Eurydice walk up to the plinth that I mentioned earlier, now a statue, watching on as she's immortalised in mythology. Grass starts to spurt up between the stones and the sun from the wedding flies down and disbands the chorus of infernal spirits. We start to see a figure silhouetted heavily against the sun, and this is Apollo. Eurydice is still watching. As some front light begins to reveal Apollo, Eurydice disappears. She's gone. Orpheo is now starting to recognise there is another presence. More and more flowers start to come between the stones from behind pillars. 
The opera finishes with one last revolve. The entryway is now lined up to the front of the stage, and Apollo and Orpheus make their way to it, looking out and walking towards the audience, now with hope renewed and the future beyond Eurydice. And that is the end of L'Orfeo. You might have noticed that the structure is often a circles, and this is because I feel the opera is very cyclical in nature. We start where we begin, and where we end, with hope. The sun is hope, nature is hope, and life goes around in circles. It's the circle of life and death and what we must all experience. There is entrances and exits, but they will always lead back to this circle. So I... Hope you have enjoyed this talk through of my storyboard and set for the Orfeo for Cape Town Opera. Hi, and welcome to my speculative production designed for Monteverdi's L'Orfeo at the Vienna State Opera, co-designed with Ken Nakajima. Set design research, looking at columns, brutalism, and the materiality of concrete. Visual dramaturgy research for the moments of descending versus ascending in the narrative. color story research, and lighting design mood boards. Inspired by film, we developed this color scheme. Set design. In Acts 1 and 2, the plot is set in Thrace, at Orfeo and Eurydice's wedding. The columns are in the formation of a temple, to serve as the backdrop for their wedding. On the right, you can see 1 to 25 scale models of the columns. In Acts 3 and 4, we transition into Hades, also known as Hell. After Orfeo is informed of Eurydice's death, his world begins to crumble around him, hence the fragmentation of the columns. On the right, you can again see 1 to 25 scale models depicting the detail in the textures And finally, in Act 5, after Orfeo does not succeed in rescuing Eurydice, he returns to Thrace, but the columns do not repair themselves, they remain fragmented. Costume design for Orfeo. Costume design for Eurydice. Costume design for Pluto and Persephone. Costume design for La Messengera, La Musica and Speranza. Costume design for the god Apollo. Costume designs for the chorus. Storyboards. In the prologue, La Musica is narrating the start of the opera Meanwhile, behind her, through a gauze, the wedding is being set up. In Act 1, the chorus and Orfeo and Eurydice are celebrating their wedding, and in Act 2, La Messengera enters, informing Orfeo of Eurydice's death, and the chorus begins to disperse and take apart the wedding setup. During the set transition, Orfeo is left in an almost blacked out stage, and then we have the interval. In Act 3, Orfeo is led by Esperanza to the River Styx to cross over to Hell, on a raft. And in Act 4, Orfeo makes a deal with Pluto and Persephone to lead Eurydice back to Thrace. And as they are doing that, Orfeo looks back and Eurydice plummets through a trapdoor 
and Orfeo is left alone to return to Thrace. And in Act 5, Apollo ascends with Orfeo to the heavens in hopes of reuniting him with Eurydice. And in the epilogue, the chorus enter as clouds, kind of as the sun sets on this tragic love story. When I can't remember, I think of who you might have been. Will you look for mistakes I've made? Only time and not Only time space and separates, not space separates us. us. I think of who you might have been. Will you look for mistakes I've made?
only time and not space. And suddenly, I'm not and suddenly, afraid of ghosts anymore. 